Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all tonight, today, this afternoon? Um, wanted to welcome you all to our panel, which is, which is officially called Beyond Google Glass, the where is the future of mobile? My name is Eric Mundell. I'm the CEO and creative director for Brightline Interactive. We are a digital experiential marketing firm that is just right outside of Washington, D.C. And basically, we design, install, and create digital experiences and social machines at sporting and entertainment uh, events for brands so that consumers can interact with these activities and ultimately share them to the world. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you all today amongst the leaders in this industry and to be presiding over this, uh, this panel. So um, before we get started, uh, just wanted to share this with you all. How many uh, in here have seen this? What I like about this photo is that it simply and powerfully demonstrates the rapid transformation of mobile connectivity and interactivity. This was taken in St. Peter's Square just moments before the Pope was announced to the crowd. The top photo obviously was taken in 2005, and the bottom photo was taken in 2013. And the biggest difference, again, is all the mobile devices that was in everyone's hands. In just under a decade, mobile uh, technology has, has revolutionized the way we interact with one another and has profoundly changed how we experience life. I wonder what this picture is going to look like the next time a pope is announced. So a few stats to back this up. In 2005, 70% of, of our uh, Americans owned a cell phone, but only 4% of those were smartphones. And you'll notice in that picture, there's only one gentleman, and I think he's got a, like a flip camera in there uh, in 2005. Fast forward to 2013, according to the Pew Research Center, 87% of Americans own cell phones, but this time 45% of them are smartphones. And if you also look at that, there's some tablets in, in that photograph. Tablets are becoming very popular and accessible and affordable. So. For the next hour, we are going to explore with this panel where things are going with mobile technology. And more importantly, how brands are going to use this technology to find and engage consumers. Mobile devices are no longer just going to be phones or smartphones that have GPS and um, you know, web browsing media and being a media player. Very soon, mobile devices are going to be integrated into everyday human interactions, everyday things, the mundane things, from monitoring or access or you know, controlling your surroundings or to, uh, to record an event and share it instantaneously. So what does this mean for brands? Basically, this means that brands are going to be able to do things that they've never done before. They're going to be able to deliver messages to platforms they've never delivered to before. And they're going to understand the consumer in a much different way than they have previously. Here's just some thoughts that I, I have. Uh, I think that we're going to venture off of the smartphone screen. And I think there's an opportunity for brands to deliver messages in new environments, new digital environments, and also new physical surfaces. In the very near future, you're going to have floors are going to be a new real estate with Pico projectors hitting them in, in your aisles. You're going to have major projections on buildings that will human or will interact with with our devices. And then also with in hallways and large format displays and screens. I think that also the barrier between the brand and the consumer will continue to shrink because you're going to have real-time, uh, personalized, targeted content so that it will be much more integrated into normal, again, interactions. Also, we're going to know a lot more about 
you know, brands are going to know a lot more about consumers. They, you know, as RF, with RFID getting into objects and NFC and Bluetooth, the behavioral patterns are just going to create new opportunities uh, for, for, us to, for us to explore and understand. There's also going to be a focus on connecting, creating, and sharing content, it, even much more so than now. We, um, as, as an experiential marketer, that's kind of what we do is we, we enable people to create content and share it. And the more data that people have and more access they have to share it with these devices connected to social uh, media and to augmented reality programs, that, that is going to increase. I wanted to share a few things that we've created that are kind of relevant to this conversation. The first one is uh, what I call a Twitter balloon. We just did this at uh, the Final Four and just closed it up last night. But, and we did it for AT&T. That's just in our fabrication shop. But basically, we drove Twitter traffic um, to blow up that balloon. And we had a set hashtag and a server that was monitoring it and an air compressor and uh, just all for the opportunity to blow it up. And the person who blew it up every hour, or however long it took, it was about an hour every time, won a new smartphone. So we're not so different than, uh, than, than uh, uh, St. Peter's Square in the fact that it has to be something very compelling that's going to make somebody pick up their mobile device and to record it. We're also using mobile devices in the field so that uh, we have field managers who are monitoring all the mobile uh, uh, social media traffic. And so we actually have mobile devices that are monitoring mobile devices in the footprint uh, that we're delivering it. Next example I wanted to show you real quick was uh, this concept of creating content that is then shared. This is something that we did at the Super Bowl for uh, Pepsi. And they sponsored the halftime show. And basically, it's a karaoke machine that makes a video. So you can personalize it immediately. You select a background, you select a song, you select uh, a front texture, and it creates a branded lower third as well. Have a great time. You're still going around the footprint. And in five minutes, you get the video on your mobile device. And, and it and it's, you know, has all the buttons for sharing, and it's all, it's all optimized in, in for SEO. And it's, it's just a really cool tool to use the mobile device as a method for um, branding. So with that, I want to uh, introduce the panel to you all. We're first going to be uh, hearing from uh, Jeremy Gilman of the Pappas Group. He's going to be discussing uh, wearable technology and how to properly use wearable technology to enhance your brand impression. We're also going to be hearing from Joe uh, DePretta from Pearl Media. He's going to be discussing the integration of mobile devices in um, non-typical experiences, such as 3D projections and tethering mobile devices to storefronts. Paul Capriolo uh, from Social Growth Technologies is going to be discussing trends in uh, ad placements within mobile devices, as well as how future sensors are going to be impacting uh, devices. And finally, we're going to conclude with Whirly uh, from Chaotic Moon, who I'm very excited to see him speak. So with that, Jeremy. Great. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm Jeremy Gilman, and uh, I run the strategy group at Pappas Group. We're an interactive uh, and full service agency that works with a, a bunch of brands. But I guess I got to start out by saying I, I have a little bit of a confession. I'm not a I'm not a mobile expert, and I'm not a technologist. I'm more of a, a strategy expert, and so it's kind of funny that I'm up here at this panel talking about mobile um, and wearables. But I guess I take it from the perspective of, you know, how can we look at uh, shifting consumer trends and, and brands and how can we build more value uh, for brands by attracting new customers potentially through wearable devices. And I think that, you know, wearables is certainly a, a huge opportunity for brands moving forward. Um, so I'll try to go through a couple of those things. I, I was attempting to show you some of the work that we have in progress at the moment with, with a couple different clients, uh, which would have been fun to show. But um, unfortunately, the lawyers and clients didn't want me to show those. Uh, so I'm going to go through more of our process and our methodology and our approach and, and hopefully leave you maybe with a couple tools or something to think about. Uh, so again, we are Pappas. I guess, first of all, 
you know, is who in this room has a, has a wearable device? A fuel band or a Fitbit or a Shine or anything? Uh, so that's a pretty good, I guess, um, percentage of people for San Francisco. I would think it'd be higher, and for this group it might be higher. Um, but I, I think the, the beauty about wearables is, is they, really, they really give us a little bit more insight into our, into our five senses. So there's this great quote from, uh, from, from Neil deGrasse Tyson um, about the five senses and, and the fact that those are faulty kind of data taking devices and they need help. And I think the, the beauty about wearables is it gives you some of that help and it lets you uh, further understand your, your body and, and your world around you. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a great opportunity for brands to, to kind of build out that area and, and really think about how can we bring more to the consumer experience? How can we help them find out more about themselves? How can we help them solve more problems through these wearable devices and, and certainly connecting them to mobile? Um, I, I think that everybody's kind of aware of, or I'm hoping that everybody is, is largely aware of the uh, landscape that's out there. I'm not going to talk about each one of these things because I only have eight more minutes, but um, Certainly, you know, we all know, I think we've heard a lot about our fuel bands and we've heard a lot about uh, things like the, the Pebble and uh, things that we haven't necessarily heard about are, you know, things like the, the Proteus Smart Pills that are ingestible pills that can be looked at as wearable technology, I guess, if you expand that, the definition of it, and something that can take uh, a measurement of our body and feed it back in, in a very uh, intuitive way for us as users to better understand and almost hack our bodies. Um, and I think that, that as, we, as we move forward in this space, the way that we look at it with our clients is that there are, there are two really big distinctions with wearables. There are wearables that are convenient, like the, the Pebble, which is really about taking your phone and, and bringing the features of your phone and other things to your wrist, to a new device. And that's maybe a, a convenient aspect. And there are things like the Fuel Band, which are really much more about usefulness uh, and utility and creating new data sets and capturing that new data and transmitting that new data back to your phone in, in some sort of format that is actionable. Uh, and, and I think the, you know, the Pebble gets a lot of press, um, and I think those things will get more press as maybe as the iWatch or something like that comes into the space. But I think the stuff that is around the fuel band and where there is new data, there's, you know, those can be certainly game-changing devices. So when we're talking about to clients about um, you know, how to approach this space, it's really about how can you be more useful? I think right now, you know, largely as, as, as our kind of habits have evolved, uh, mobile is about usefulness and connecting with consumers is about providing utility. Uh, at least that's how we, we approach it. And I think if you approach it that way and you think about your brand and your consumers and unmet needs and you try to innovate in that space and really look at how can we invent to, to add more value to this relationship, I think you can grow your brand and there's opportunities for brands. I guess as I was thinking about this, I was thinking back to kind of my first job, which was at, which was working on Johnson and Johnson. And in my first week in the job, we had to go into homes with new parents and do some some ethnographies with them. So we were trying to understand how life changes right after uh, a, a new baby is born. And during that whole process, we watched how they were tracking, um, you know, feeding. They were tracking. Uh, all, all sorts of interesting stuff, and, and that, that wasn't exactly the, the sexiest first job in the industry, but it was really important for me, uh, and it was really important to realize that having, a, like, the whole insight behind that was having a baby changes everything, and um, what we realized was that new parents can't possibly get enough information. They can't possibly get enough advice, and for J&J, &J, that led to the launch of, of Baby Center, which was a content play that's 10 years ago, and I think that the way that brands were really approaching how to be more useful for their, with their consumers and build more value was, was really around content. Uh, and today, we're still largely thinking about content, but I think as we look at wearables and we look at other technology, there's ways to add more value through, through these technologies. And I think that wearables can certainly uh, fill that void and create more value and be more useful for consumers. Um, and the reason why is because I think wearables help people and us make, make the invisible visible. Uh, I think that's, that's a little bit tough to wrap your mind around, but if not really, because I think that in general, if you can make the, the invisible visible about our bodies and we look at things like you know, fitness, health, and life tracking, where we're really capturing data that we've never captured before, um, that can be a really, a really powerful place for brands. And they're looking at things like movement and heart rate and things like that. And as those jump forward into the next generation for brands, you can really look at health indicators and look at how those can be diagnostic devices, et cetera. And in our world, um, 
you know, I think if we're t talking about wearables and making the invisible visible on our world side, it's more about projecting data over, you know, the world that we live in and whether that's augmented reality or whatever we want to call it. Um, that's that's kind of the route that that the Google Glass uh, product is is trying to go, which, in a way, is a memory augmentation idea. I'm more focused on on the the our bodies part and capturing data because I think that's a more interesting space and that's really about true innovation uh, for brands and opportunities for brands to to change the relationship that you have with your customers. Um, the other opportunity I think in wearables is to put an end to dumb objects. I'm going to just kind of fly through this because I think a lot of people are kind of sick of hearing about the internet of things, but taking objects that exist, whether I'm a brand that, that produces socks or clothing or, um, you know, whether I'm a, a watch company like, you know, or a new watch company like Pebble and bringing more intelligence to that and connecting it back to my uh, various devices or even looking at the, the smallest objects that, we, that are already part of our everyday life and bringing intelligence to those and technology to those uh, to really you know, bring a layer of data and insight into something that, that we haven't really looked at before. Uh, so, you know, how can brands approach wearable technology? We really look at it in two ways. You can invent, which I think is the most fun way, and it's about innovation and finding a team and solving a real problem with a new solution. Maybe that's an ecosystem, and those are things like the up, and I think the brands that have been most successful in doing that so far have been kind of the Adidas and the Nikes of the world, and that might even be the low-hanging fruit in that respect because it is, um, you know, fitness and, and there's a natural re kind of bridge to that area. Or you can join in and that's really about, you know, building on top of the platforms that already exist. I think that I, I liken that sort of to, you know, for all the times that we built lots of websites for campaigns or mini sites, you know, we, we did that and we built our own thing and had our own little kind of idea over there. But today we much, are much more focused on you know, recognizing that there are platforms with a billion people on them and it makes a whole lot more sense to build on those platforms. So if we can build off those APIs and take advantage of you know, what's coming from uh, Google, I think that that's an opportunity as well. Uh, really quickly, the way that this kind of, I guess, free thought process for you, but the way that we approach this um, is to try to isolate a problem and then we look at you know, the technology uh, and the sensors that can measure the, the indicators that we're looking for. So if my example is sleep here, which I guess it's a really low level example, but the sensors and things like that that can track our sleep patterns and be, and be indicators for us in terms of how can, I, how, how can I understand why I can't sleep? Are there things that can, get, that can track my, my uh, caffeine intake, my exercise? What, what's the ecosystem that could be built around that? and collect and analyze that data to display it in a really beautiful and meaningful way, at least today, on a mobile device. Um, and then, you know, obviously what we're trying to get to is the point where I have an action to take where I can improve upon the problem that I might have. And, and as, a, as a somebody that advises brands, the way that I look at this is I say, well, there's a huge opportunity for a brand to solve this problem and have a completely different relationship with consumers. Uh, and something for me that comes to mind with this is, is Z-Quil, the new, the new NyQuil uh, kind of product that launched that doesn't have the cold medicine in it anymore because everybody was taking NyQuil to fall asleep. So if somebody like ZQuil could, could approach this problem and understand that they're all about sleep, but how can we use technology or a wearable device like this to help consumers really understand better their, their sleep habits, I think that engenders a, a lot more value for their brand and a lot more love for that brand uh, from consumers and, and helps them kind of redefine what they're about and redefine uh, the relationship they have with consumers. Uh, so this last slide, if we take a couple other examples, let's say I'm a, I'm, I'm a ner nervous parent uh, or I don't get why I can't lose weight. These are all problems that we might have that we could solve with these wearable devices or I get dehydrated a lot or I can never remember names. Uh, on the I'm a nervous parent idea, you know, there's, there's technology that is being developed from MC10 that's a smart patch that just sits on your skin and kind of can monitor uh, heart rate and <laughs> respiration and temperature and uh, all those kind of inf important indicators. And I think as, as a parent, if I could have some of that insight into my newborn baby that I'm terrified about because I, I, I don't know that I'm a good parent yet, I think that can create a really valuable experience for me as the parent, but also you know, for a conversation that I might have with my pediatrician. It might create a whole lot of data that would be useful for him as well. So I think about, you know, we constantly think about these brands that could possibly bring these products to market. The next one is, again, those Proteus Smart Pills and Weight Watchers could do something like that. 
or that same, that same pill that's about measuring dehydration, why can't somebody like vitamin water that really only has a relationship through the product they're, that they're offering today think about how technology can, can broaden that relationship with consumers through these wearable devices? Uh, and the last one is really about not my body, but in the world. You know, I have a problem, and I apologize to anybody in advance, but I have a horrible problem with names. Um, and if I, if I could build an application on top of Google Glass someday, if, if it works, uh, that, that, gave me, that, that gave me names uh, immediately upon facial recognition, that would be a really valuable thing. I don't know if it'll ever work, but I can think about these things at least and how they can expand the relationship that brands can have with their consumers. So lastly, you know, I think it's important to, to think about these things because Forrester predicts that there are going to be 480 million of these wearable devices by 2018, which is a pretty enormous number. And if we look at, you know, a Pew poll that says uh, something like 53% of millennials would rather give up their sense of smell than their technology, you know, I think that, it, it, you know, with that as a context, we know consumer habits are shifting and we have to catch up as, as brands or kind of be left behind. So that's what I have. Um, thank you for your time, and I will invite up uh, Bruce. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe DePretta. I'm uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Pearl Media. And as you know, this is uh, beyond Google Glass. And today, my little spiel will be underscored by the word beyond. Um, I'll be talking sort of about mobile as an adjunct. Um, and I guess the best way to kick it off is to talk about mobile from an advertising perspective. Um, advertising Age, as most if not all of you know, is the um, industry publication, the advertising industry obviously, that um, every year it names an agency of the year. About four years ago, its agency of the year was the consumer. And I think now, based especially on the, on the photograph that um, Eric showed in his introduction in St. Peter's Square, this position, holding that smartphone up, holding that mobile device up, really should make the consumer the advertising agency of the year again, because their involvement in transferring brand messaging and content and sharing has grown exponentially since three years ago. So that's really going to be the core of what I'm talking about. Uh, Pearl Media is a uh, company that um, we're, we started out as an out-of-home company. Now we're more of a content-driven media company. And the crown jewel in our portfolio is what we refer to as 3D projection mapping. Um, and the reason Kate Moss's picture up there is because I'm dating her. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Kate Moss's picture is there because one of the um, 3D pr um, projection experiences that we did in February is we kicked off and launched the 2013 Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. And we took over 51, I'm sorry, 56,000 square feet of Caesars Palace architecture. So if you can imagine uh, Kate Moss and Alyssa Miller and uh, the rest of the team at 51,000 square feet of Caesars Palace, it was quite quite a spectacle. But the point is, what Pearl Media does is we create, we, we actually use cutting edge technology, and I, I hate that term, I hear myself using it, cutting, cutting edge technology with high impact inventory to create lasting impressions with consumers. And we, I shouldn't say we, I often refer to 3D projection technology as the gateway drug to other media. And that other media includes traditional, digital, social, earned, and especially mobile. Now, if, if you track with me that 3D projection technology is the gateway drug to other media, mobile is then the transference and the next gateway with the brand message to the consumer. Let me give you a little context, and I'll show you a great example of what I'm talking about. We did a, pro we did a projection experience January 17th in downtown Los Angeles. The client is a company called LoopNet. For additional context, LoopNet is a 2.5 or $2.8 billion NASDAQ cap company. And they are the number one global online lister of commercial real estate. Their positioning is if your commercial property is not listed on LoopNet, 
it might as well be invisible. So they asked us to produce a whole event for them, from soup to nuts. Uh, Pearl Media handled all the staging, the lighting, uh, the catering, the security, the permitting, et cetera, plus, of course, the 3D projection immersive experience. So our goal was to make a downtown Los Angeles building disappear. So I'm going to show you what happened th that evening, and then we'll talk about the results. Oh, but that one night was more than just right. I didn't leave you because I was all through. Oh, I was overwhelmed and frankly scared as hell because I really fell for you. Oh, I swear to you, I'll be there for you. This is not a crime, crime, crime. crime. Just a shy guy looking for to buy. Help you back on. So that particular event, uh, and, and you know, I, I, sometimes I have to remind myself because we, Pearl Media, 
knock on wood, we tend to work with well-known global brands, Coke, um, Lexus, Chevy, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit, um, Hyundai, Pepsi. And while LoopNet is a phenomenal product, uh, phenomenal company, it's not in the everyday common consumer vernacular. So keeping that in mind, and of course we got the band train, obviously, to uh, perform, that in one week, this 3D projection, this five-minute piece, got over 2.5 million impressions. And 29% of that 2.5 million was content sharing through mobile usage. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal number. For a little additional context, <clears throat> over the last 18 months, Pearl Media executed a number of 3D projection programs for all sorts of brands, all of whom I've just mentioned. Uh, and the result is consistent, that consumers are awestruck. And their natural reaction is to pull out their smartphones, start shooting, post it in social media, but perhaps a little more importantly than just the social media, pass it from consumer to consumer. So that's a five minute, if, if your average 3D projection is between four and five minutes, that's four to five minutes of a brand's message being shared from consumer to consumer. So if you put that in terms of media dollars, if the, um, how much would you have to pay for your brand to be viewed online by 500,000 people for five minutes, then factor, the, factor in the impression your brand makes and the conversations your brand has created. Sharing links with friends is an instant endorsement of your brand within the consumer's network, and that's much more powerful than if it's coming direct from the advertiser. So we've had great success, we continue to have great success, but again, the mobile component is key to that viral contagion. This doesn't, the, the mobile component and the mobile catalyst to viral contagion isn't just 3D projection centric. Um, the TNT network is one of our clients. They had a show with uh, Angie Harmon, I'm not sure if it's still on, it was on uh, up the, at least through a year ago, called Rizzoli and Isles. And it wasn't doing quite so well in the ratings. And one of the barriers was that they found that consumers who may be interested in the show referred to the show as that show with Angie Harmon and the other person. So they asked us to try to see how we can bridge <clears throat> um, an experiential component that would get their target to be more interested and immersed in, into this content. So we created an interactive crime scene in New York and Los Angeles where consumers actually would use their mobile device to not only, excuse me, help solve the crime and have some fun, but once they entered their mobile information, the following weeks, whenever the show was about to air, if it aired at uh, 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, those consumers involved would get a text rem um, excuse me, reminding them that the show was going to go on in a half hour. So here's what happened. Thank you. Pearl Media has built an interactive crime scene to help promote the new season of TNT's Rosolian Isles. We replicated a murder crime scene inside the space complete with custom props and evidence tags. We tied it to an interactive display on the storefront windows. Brand ambassadors handed out Rosolian Isles postcards with gameplay instructions and tuning information. Pedestrians are asked to help Rosolian Isles solve the crime. Once gameplay is activated, the pedestrians run a variety of forensic tests like dusting for fingerprints and DNA testing. As the player completed various forensic tests, the clue associated with that test inside the crime scene was illuminated. The player is introduced to a number of suspects and must decide who committed the crime. If they choose correctly, they get to take their photo with Rizzoli and Isles and post that picture to Facebook. campaign had an extensive mobile component as well. This was the first ever NFC-enabled storefront, a new interactive mobile experience activated by simply tapping your phone to the storefront. We also incorporated QR codes allowing players and pedestrians not only to download the games to their cell phones, 
but also to access rich media content like wallpapers and trailers of the show. So, bottom line on the Rizzoli and Isles piece, um, we had over 50,000 participants, excuse me, in a four-week period. Uh, TNT was thrilled. They've asked us back for a couple of other shows that we're currently working on, so I can't go into detail, into detail today because uh, stuff is in development. Um, I want to show you something that really epitomized our first experience and how this can work interactively. Uh, we just won a number of awards for this. We did a project for Chevy in L.A. Uh, on, the, on the storied Roosevelt Hotel on Hollywood and Highland. They were launching the Chevy Sonic, and the Chevy Sonic was a very affordable, peppy, sporty car. And they wanted to create a two-night, not just 3D experience, but interactive 3D experience. And we created the Guinness Book, the Guinness Book of World Record largest interactive 3D claw game in history. So without further ado, I want to show you this. It's pretty cool. We've got here four days in advance, and it takes us a good two to three days to actually line up every single projector with every measurement we have with every line in the building to ensure we project the building back onto the building. It's seamless. We've never done this before. This is something completely new. Um, it was something that Chevrolet challenged us all to do. Uh, we did a lot of research development, a lot of testing. Uh, we've been working on this for about three and a half to four months now, figuring out different ways that we can use the actual creative with the interaction and making sure that they're working simultaneously. Somewhere between 30 to 40 people uh, from the setup of the street to the design of the game to the actual projectionist and the creative. It's quite a few hands that, that make this happen. Please direct your attention to the world-famous Roosevelt Hotel for a one-of-a-kind presentation from Chevrolet. We're doing the first ever 3D interactive architectural mapping projection at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, California. On the street we have a, uh, a life-size joystick which is about three and a half feet tall and what we're uh, enabling them to do is actually control the claw that's actually going to be projected in the game on the building. This is really exciting from a pro media standpoint. We strive to do things that are different and unique and we're always challenged by our clients to do something that's never been done before. And so it is definitely a first, and as well as to have that interaction between the consumers and the projection, and then live prizes awarded on site is something that you know, makes us uh, totally different than any other program we've ever done or we've ever seen executed. All right, and then you guys are going to get started here. Make your way over to the white registration tent. Get yourself a chance to win a brand new Chevy Sonic. We're about to begin. So it makes us so unique, um, while we've done other 3D projections in the past, this is the first time we've ever actually allowed consumers to actually interact with the projection. By moving the claw and hitting a gas pedal, when the claw drops into the prize box, you can win great prizes, including we're going to be giving away an uh, actual vehicle. So step right up, try to look, see if you've got the skills to maneuver the claw to grab yourself an awesome prize.
This particular piece, and, and I have to give Chevy a whole lot of credit, but especially the San Francisco-based phenomenally talented agency, Goodby and Silverstein, who we worked with on this. Uh, Chevy saw the value, not just in the technology of 3D projection, but, on, uh, but in what 3D projection catalyzes. And within, we, this was a two-night event, as I mentioned, on um, Hollywood and Highland, on the Roosevelt Hotel. And we had about between 15 and 17,000 people each night. We got permits, we closed off Hollywood Boulevard. As you saw, someone actually won the Chevy Sonic. People won from snowboards to uh, Fender Stratocasters to surfboards. And Jimmy Kimmel covered it the next night. Extra covered it. So the amount of earned media, even, even, even before the, the, the mobile and social media viral spread, we received about 7 million impressions in a 48-hour period. So when I say somewhat flippantly that it's a gateway media to other media or a gateway drug to other media, it truly is that. And mobile, mobile really is the latch key that opens up those additional doors of viral spread. And again, not just in social, but just from consumer to consumer content sharing. Um, I know my, my clock is running a little quick, but I just want to say in terms of what's next, you know, keeping with this, with the concept of beyond Google Glass, what's next for us, we're always looking at what's next. One of the things we're working, and I can, I can tell you because we're coming out with it for a brand very shortly, for this 3D projection and interactivity, we developed something that we're marketing to the fashion industry as well as to events, sporting events, trade shows, etc. Picture two mannequins a male and a female, we can actually project. So if, let's say, you're walking past a window in the gap, um, we could actually map each of those mannequins to change pristine, crystal clear outfits every five to 10 seconds. So let's say over a 60 second period, you're seeing anywhere from eight to 12 different outfits. Someone can walk by during a busy holiday season, see an outfit they want, capture it on their cell phone, text that shot to that clerk in the Gap or wherever, give your credit card number, go out, have a cup of coffee, come back and your outfit is wrapped, sold, and ready to go. So there's lots that we can do. We're always looking at what's next. Mobile will always be a key component. Uh, unlike my peers up here who are infinitely smarter than me technologically, uh, as chief marketing officer, I look at it as how can we make a brand be um, more severely connected and tethered to the consumer with that content. So I thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. As Eric introduced, my name is Paul Capriolo, and we have an in-app ad platform that drives millions of brand dollars through user engagements on iOS and Android. What I'd like to share with you today is what we might see as new ways to target users and how this might lead to a new, hyper-relevant type of advertising. Now, before we dive into some of what the new capabilities could be, it's important to frame the conversation. Today we have smartphones, tablets, e-readers, etc., but all of these are really a subset of mobile computing. So ultimately, the industry we're talking about today is the broader mobile computing industry. Has mobile really changed everything? Yes, absolutely. It, it's a bit of a silly question, especially given this track and this conference. But the reason why I asked is that if you look at technically what's different, aside from knowing a more exact and dynamic location, there hasn't been an access to a ton of game-changing data used to make better advertising decisions. So when I think about what's next, my line of thought is basically, what if my device was always out of my pocket and in the open, while ignoring what the exact physical device would be? Right now, our device shares a dark and lint-filled recess with our wallets and keys. Now imagine you took it out of your pants and showed it to the world. Basically, imagine a Don Draper character following you. So when this happens and the, and the device is now fixed to our person, we get a tremendous amount of new information about people and their lives. More importantly, we get a fun acronym, creepy, 
context responsive, emotion environment, purpose, and you. Uh, to be totally honest, I did come up with the acronym first and work backwards. Uh, sorry, not sorry. So let's dive into kind of what I mean by this. Context. Where am I? Who am I with? Which way am I facing? Location-based can only do so much. Yes, if I'm in a Starbucks, I'm probably getting coffee. But what if I'm just sitting there tomorrow for three hours using their free Wi-Fi because the conference is over and my red eye isn't until 11 o'clock? Response. This targeting is all about understanding a user's routine and being able to respond to the user's perceived needs. When and why do I want to know about a coffee shop down the street? Emotion, I like this one. Emotion is all about how I'm feeling, what my tone is, what my posture is. If I'm doing something, am I invested in it? Am I watching basketball because I love it? Or just because I want to hang out with my friends and eat their food? Environment. This is all about what's happening around me and how the environment impacts my needs, my wants, or my interests. Again, much deeper than simply where I am, because lots of things happen at the same place at the same time, just like here. Some are relevant, and some are irrelevant to me. Purpose, the why. Location is secondary to your purpose at a location in many situations. If I'm at the park picking up trash for my community service, knowing about the fun stuff going on at the park is probably a waste of ad dollars. Maybe an ad for a better lawyer is the right thing to show someone at the park on a sunny Sunday afternoon. And finally, you. All of these new capabilities and more really mean that advertisers can finally understand you. What motivates you, what drives you, and ultimately what you want and what you're looking for. Now all of this has the ability to happen with more and more automation. We all laughed at Siri when it came out, at least I did. But through iterations, these mobile computing devices are truly becoming hands-free as they begin to rely on voice, training, and image recognition. Now in this brave new world that I've described, who has the keys to the kingdom? In my opinion, the answer is operating systems. Operating systems control this data and have the power to rig the deck by giving themselves or select partners access to exclusive data. This isn't something standardized like a tracking pixel, a cookie, or an IP address. There are no data, these are data points that can be 100% controlled and limited by the OS. I'm going to leave you with three things to think about. The first, is this going to be adopted? Not by advertisers, but by consumers. Think about how useful a Bluetooth headset is. And then think about the stigma that currently surrounds it and its total lack of adoption. Now multiply by a million, and you may have Google Glass. Second, will there be anything but mobile computing in the future? What will a desktop or laptop really be able to do that a mobile device, maybe hooked up to a monitor and keyboard, won't be able to do? Also, will there really be a difference between an app and a website? Today there is because of tech limitations, but when those walls break down and standards are tightened, what's the real difference? And finally, for you and your business, think about what you would do if you knew everything. If you do this, and if we move towards more perfect information about consumers and users, you'll have a roadmap of what you can do with new opportunities to target and engage users as they arise. Thank you very much. Okay, is that one? Is that one on? Yeah. No, it's that one. Oh, that's fine. Where is it? On switch. Oh, he turned it on. It's good. It's good now. Are you guys fucking sleeping or something? <laughs> As, and if one of you tries to leave the room while I'm talking, I will throw this fucking mic and knock you out. I'm talking to one of you guys. He's sitting back down. Good job. All right, so here's the deal. So do you guys want to know what Chaotic Moon does? Fucking Google it. I don't advertise my company. We make millions of dollars doing really cool shit. That's what we do. Some of it could be advertising, maybe not. I don't know. Our director of marketing, though, is here, and I'd like to tell him a few key points, if you don't mind me taking a second out. Jonathan, um, people with their logo on the side, you need to remind me to do that. That was good. Everybody did that. Um, also, um, I should have slides that are better instead of images I picked off the internet. And um, so uh, don't, here's my slides. They're pretty ridiculous. Um, 
you guys want to know about technology. So we're an engineering firm, and we do really, really cool technology. And sometimes, you know what? You don't actually need any technology for any of this. So forget Google Glasses, forget all of that. What I want to talk about is just a very quick part of the future of things that you think are far off that aren't. Like in 2006, when I was like, dude, Steve Jobs is making an iPhone. And people were like, that is fucking retarded. He is going to get killed. And then now all of you have iPhones. And then some of you have Android phones. Um, because he should have bought Android. And then you would just have like an Android iPhone. It would be amazing. So ambient technology. Several people have talked about this stuff. This is a really cool one. This is dynamic paint. So there's a, a friend of mine. I went over to Amsterdam in December because um, the city of Amsterdam, for some god-awful, stupid reason, flew me over to talk to them. And there was a guy named Dan Rosengarten. And Dan Rosengarten has this awesome view on technology, which is, um, I don't need it. I've got all this other stuff I can do. And so what he did is he made this dynamic paint so that the highway, like when it's cold, it shows you there could be ice on the road. And uh, when there's a road hazard, it can do stuff. This paint's just reactive. It's just paint. It's amazing. And then somebody came to him and was like, hey, could you do some advertising or something with that? Like, if we sponsored it? And he's working that in there. And that's a really great idea. But ambient technologies are where everything's going to go. This is a retarded interface. This makes you look dumb. And I wrote a Business Week op-ed on augmented reality. Get over the hype. Be done with that, please. You can go look up that up. But in 1993, Tom Caldell coined that phrase because he didn't want to cut through the side of a Boeing jetliner and cut through the electrical cables. And in 1994, I was in an Apple R&D project where they were talking about that. And we found out that like, if you hold a pin out here and you bring it in and you focus on it, this like, putting interface right here is very discomforting. Six out of 10 people vomit. It's really not cool. Um, <laughs> and also, if you're wearing Google Glasses, and all due respect, because this guy it was one of my favorite guys. Um, if you have my name and you can't remember it and it's telling it to you, that is like beyond disingenuous. I am done with you. Like our relationship is over. <laughs> That's, I mean, you don't even have to remember my name. You could just say like, dude, that'd be great. But ambient technologies are great. Ambient, there used to be a thing called the ambient orb. You guys remember that? These guys from MIT Media Lab were way ahead of their time. They were like, we're going to have an orb that glows colors, and you can monitor your stock. And so the idea was that everybody would have one and monitor their stock. Um, and they didn't realize not everybody had stock. Uh, but they sold them at Brookstone. You can still get them on eBay and stuff, but they're really cool. What the idea behind ambient technologies is, and you have to think of this as advertisers, and I have to think of this from an engineering standpoint, the idea is how do you take all of the stuff that's on the computer and put it out into the environment. So things like the 3D projectors, right, would be great for that. So the walls turn colors when certain things are going on. If your door isn't locked when you're leaving the garage, it's red. All of these different Internet of Things devices, which is, I agree, a very overused term, um, all of these things kind of out into the environment. What happens when it's like Star Trek and you're like, computer, why is the house so fucking cold? I spent $300 on a nest. Um, which brings us to uh, the Internet of Things and the Nest, which is awesome. Except when they don't talk to each other and one makes the bottom part of my house cold and the other one is like, I've got to warm this up so it makes it colder and they just go back and forth. Uh, so I have to talk to somebody that constructed that house. Um, but the Internet of Things is great. You know, we talked about all these wearable computing devices. Look, get over it. I bought everybody that I knew a Nike Fit band and I was like, this is going to help them. People are lazy. Right? My business partner did not lose a pound, and he didn't wear it past four or five days. All right? I took it apart to see what was inside of it. It's really neat if you take one apart. It's very, very good design. But Internet of Things are things that are, that are connected to the Internet. It's an overused term. Get over it. You know where technology is going? Wherever the fuck you are at. It's there. That's where it's going. It, it didn't go mobile. There's no such thing as a mobile computing. We say mobile computing on our website because that's the buzzword of the day. It's pervasive computing. The fact is, technology is going to go wherever you are going. If it's in your car, there'll be new infotainment systems. If it's in your bathroom, there'll be you know, a tub that has projection in it and other things. There'll be all of these things. So Internet of Things, agreed, overused term, but it's very valuable for you to know as advertisers because how are you going to get to people that are connected through all of these different devices? My advice would be don't. Because if I have something in my house that you advertise through like that, I'm going to find you and kill you. <laughs> I don't want a Viagra ad anywhere near the bedroom at all. I don't want any kind of ads anywhere in my house. 
And that leads us to kind of the scary future when all of this comes together, which is transhumanism. Anybody heard transhumanism before, H+, you guys know what that is? So I spoke at a conference where a guy named Aubrey Gray and a bunch of people were talking about this, and they are, you heard about the singularity though, right? Because Ray Kurzweil is a marketing genius. Maybe we should talk to him about advertising. No, let's not do that. So this picture is kind of creepy, um, and so is transhumanism. The idea is that we take technology, we implant it in our bodies. Now you wanna think this is like 20, 30, 40 years in the future, and it's not. When I was at this conference in 2006, there was a guy who planted magnets into his fingers, and we were on a panel similar to this, and he was like, I can tell you that the Wi-Fi is over there. And I was like, hang on a second. Oh, it's called Bill 2006. <laughs> Whoops. Um, there are people leaning towards this, and this is not as distant a future as you think. Um, you should all go look up a documentary by a guy named Iborg. He lost his eye in a shotgun accident. He's replaced it with a camera, and he does documentary film, uh, you know, films around the world. It's the greatest gimmick ever. He's like, why should you hire me? My eye is a fucking camera. <laughs> I just put some sunglasses on and get that footage for you. Um, and he did a really cool one for this company called, um, I don't even know the name of the company, I don't want to advertise them, but they got a video game. And so he went around the world and he interviewed real life cyborgs. And if you go look this up, Deus Ex is the name of the game. If you go up, look up Deus Ex, Cyborg, Google that shit, you're gonna see some awesome stuff. You know, people that have, you know, robotic legs and there's a guy that can, you know, see things. He was blind, you know, 10 days before. It's pretty amazing stuff. And that's, you know, the technology and us we're gonna merge at some point in the future, and that's when I'm just gonna kill myself. Because um, I help engineer that shit, and let me tell you what, I'm not putting any of it in me, ever. <laughs> it sounds horrible. I work with the guys that build that stuff. But the, the transhumanism stuff, the thing that you have to, to look at and you have to think about is, Google Glasses doesn't work as an interface, but if I could directly tie into the optic nerve, and if I could just look up and be like, oh, I just quick, you know, queried Wikipedia, and poof, there it is in front of me, Maybe there's a whole bunch of people who'd sign up for that. What does that do to advertising? What does that do to how you get the message? You know, that's either really, really great engagement, which as a user I hate, or it's really, really bad technology in general. But these are things that you think are in the future that are not in the future. And so I'd like to tell you, you know, if you're sitting here and you are trying to figure out what your mobile strategy is, too late. <laughs> you should work on your resume or something. <laughs> like. <laughs> That was 2006, <laughs> we're done with that. Um, if you're sitting here trying to figure out an internet of things, also too late. You need to start thinking about the real future. You need to start thinking about when Google gets every state to pass a license for a autonomous vehicle and think about what could you do with advertising in a vehicle when you have a captive audience going somewhere for a 30 minute drive. Probably force them to suicide. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> that sounds horrible. But these are the things you have to think about. Um, trends and technology trends used to happen over decades, you know, years and decades, and they don't do that anymore. You know, everybody, if you go back and you Google about the iPhone right before it came out, just a few short years ago, people were like, Apple's making a phone? That's stupid. They're gonna fail. What do they know about phones, right? These things are happening faster and faster. The iterations between them are happening faster and faster. Your way you're gonna advertise in the next year is going to be different. In the next three years, it's gonna be dramatically different. In the next five years, you're probably not even gonna know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> and honestly, from some of the looks on your faces, I'm kinda of wondering if any of you know what the fuck you're doing now. <laughs> that's just how I feel, I don't do advertising. But that's it, I wanna to get to questions, cause what I like, and I believe you wanted me to, I'm gonna be like the mic boy, right? It's uh, awesome. What I like is I wanna know why the hell you showed up and we have an amazing panel here, some really, really smart people. So you're gonna raise your hand, I'll come out in the audience. If I don't like your question, I'll just. Um, and we'll go to the next question. There are stupid questions. That's just a fact. There are, don't ask one, please. So who's first?